Wow. Thank you very much. Um, wow, look at all these beautiful faces. It's a great way to start the day. Thank you very much for being here. It's, I'm really grateful and honored to be here at Creative Mornings Houston with you to talk a little bit about transparency. But before we do that, I'd kind of like to, in regard to your badges, I didn't get to talk with all of you, obviously, and I kind of want to hear some of those aliases. Um, do any of you have any really creative, super strange aliases? Just yell them out. I want to hear them. ZZ Topless. ZZ Topless. <laughs> That's a great way to start the day, too. Well, <laughs> well done. <laughs> How about some others? Does anybody want to go after that? <laughs> oh, that's great. What? Banana peel? Oh, nice. Very nice. Well, since you've all been kind enough to share with me, I'll share mine with you. The one I use the most is Fred Mertz. Does anybody remember Fred Mertz from the I Love Lucy show? Yeah, I use that because most of the people I hang out with need a straight man on a regular basis, and that's kind of my role. So I see a few familiar faces here this morning, but a lot of you uh, I don't know, so let me introduce myself as myself. My name is Jared Gullett, and uh, I'm a principal and producer at Proud Pony International. Proud Pony International is a Houston-based new media collective specializing in high-quality motion pictures and creative dressage. And what that really means is that we've worked in the trenches long enough to have a lot of really talented friends who can make all your wildest video fantasies come true. So that's what we do. Um, the other half of Proud Pony International is my friend Travis Johns. He's also principal co-founder, writer, director, editor, motion graphics artist, creative director, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> So that sort of begs the question, what the hell do I actually do? Um, I had a friend uh, last week trying to figure that out, and he finally came up with the notion that my job is to smoke cigarettes and flip people off. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's what I do. So now we have um, uh, all of that out of the way. Um, let's get to the subject at hand, uh, which is transparency. And I'd like to start this with just kind of seeing what you think of when you hear the word transparency. Does anyone want to offer? What, do you, what's, what comes to mind when you hear transparency? Clear, honesty, vulnerability? Politics. Politics. <laughs> We're playing the opposite game, apparently. <laughs> um, well, those are all exactly right and uh, I in considering this I kind of came to the conclusion that for me transparency involves some kind of a filter and light whether that's a window or you're seeing sunlight through fabric where the image is sort of hazed or you're just kind of examining the world with your own naked little eyes trying to determine exactly what it is you're seeing so ultimately our perception comes down to the way we filter the information we take in. And I'd like to propose today that the idea that in creative work, we are the filter. We're the window, and we're the material through which the light passes. And it's our job and our responsibility to make decisions that affect how our audience views any chosen subject. So transparency is certainly important, you know, in the business side of what we do with our clients, with our vendors, with our coworkers, but for today's purposes, I'd really like to focus the lens on um, creative endeavors. And as we move forward, I'd really like all of you to consider your work's relationship to transparency. And in return, I'm going to offer you a few specific examples of that uh, in regard to a project we've been working on at Proud Pony um, for the past year and a half we've been working on a feature-length documentary that's based on a short film we made a few years ago called The Trouble with Ray. And The Trouble with Ray is about local civil rights activist Ray Hill, the evolution of the LGBT community in Houston, and its connections to the greater na national movement. So essentially we're working to preserve a history that hardly anyone is really aware of. It's kind of obscured at best. 
And uh, we're working to document all these stories before it's too late and they're sort of lost to the ethers. And it's a really, really big job. Um, trying to wrap our arms around 50 years of stories and history and consider at this point, the only script that exists is the script that we create. So um, how do we start that process and, and how do we figure out where the story lies? I think this is, if you really consider it, this is where we all start with the creative project. What's the story that we want to tell? Ultimately, we're the ones who have the power to make that and, and influence that decision, and it's an important one. So here, once again, we come back to the idea that we are the filter, right, for the transparency. How do we show the world what we're seeing and perceiving? So uh, in our case, with The Trouble with Ray, we started by asking and answering our own questions, right? So in film, we call this part of the process pre-production, and we've spent the past three years sort of allowing that process to evolve. Um, we started this project kind of by chance. We, we met Ray Hill at a party, and we sat down with him uh, at a table for about two hours where he regaled us with stories of of being Tennessee Williams driver and friends with Harvey Milk and the first march on Washington, all these Supreme Court cases that decided civil rights issues for all of us. And we were blown away, completely intrigued and charmed by Ray. Does anyone here know Ray Hill or know of Ray Hill? A few of you? Yeah. Ray Hill is a character, a force of nature, and a very rare um, human being. Um, so at the onset, we knew we had to preserve these stories and started pre-interviewing people, people we thought we might want to interview, historians, archivists. And along the way, just occasionally, we'd hear things like, Ray Hill's a liar. <clears throat> you can't believe anything he says. Ray Hill is all about Ray Hill. Well, obviously, this throws up red flags when you're trying to get to the bottom of the story and determine how and what you want to say. Um, I, uh, you know, it became really clear that in order to really understand how to tell the story, we had to feel certain we had the full picture and un understood the truth about every aspect that we were exploring. So a, a funny story, just kind of an aside, around this time, Travis, my partner and I, uh, took Ray to Cleburne's before it burned down, right? And we're having lunch and he's in the middle of the story, as always, Ray likes to talk. And uh, as he's telling the story, a woman walks behind him and points at his head and says, he lies, he's a liar. Don't believe anything he says. Well, red flags, right? I mean, what the hell? So, um, <clears throat> so we turned to Ray and said, uh, do you know that lady? And he says, no. And then just continues on with his story, right? <laughs> so at this point, the only thing we really know is, is that... Um, Ray's an ornery old man who won't shut the hell up. Um, really, he can suck all the oxygen out of a room. He's, he's made a career out of that, and I'm so grateful for it. It's, it's worked for him. But at this point, with all this confusion, we obviously needed to get to the bottom of all this, and we traveled around the city and the country, and we sorted through reams and reams of historical images and documents and video. Uh, we con conducted lots of pre-interviews before we ever generated our first treatment, which is a story outline, in case you, you're not aware. And we couldn't be married to that first version because as we did more interviews and followed the parts of the story that resonated most strongly with us, we kept discovering more and more, more interest, more intrigue, and we've revised and added information to our film we couldn't have imagined at the onset, all by doing this research. We're currently on our third treatment, and I think it's our final one. Um, I hope it is. Um, and we did all of this research so we could feel confident that we're representing the truth, or at least the version of the truth that we discovered through our research, and so we can answer questions and know with full confidence and understand that we know the realities of our story. So now that we've gathered all the facts, how do we make decisions about how we want to present this information? How do we filter everything for our audience? So once again, we come back to the idea that we've done all of this work and we still have some filtering to do as creatives. This brings us to post-production, which is actually where we are in our process right now. We're assembling the film 
And this brings a myriad of new choices, new opportunities to filter what we've learned. So, you know, we go into the edit suite and you sit down with your story outline and our chapters, chapters and you begin assembling, but this is a film. We're not just telling a story here, right? It's not just a bunch of talking heads up on a screen all lined out in chronological order, right? We also need to keep it entertaining and make it something that people actually want to watch. That would be nice. So I'm going to go back to Ray Hill here once again. Because the truth of what we discovered in our pre-production is that Ray Hill is not a liar. He loves to embellish his story. He makes it a whole hell of a lot better than it actually was. <laughs> he does, he does, but the kernel is still there. Lord knows he loves to stir the pot, he loves to cause trouble and get people riled up, mostly to get them talking about what he wants them to be talking about. So not unlike Ray, you know, uh, so not unlike Ray, we're trying to merge these elements. The goal is to balance the truth with entertainment and add visual elements that support the story and editing people and things so they're, so they're presented in the most logical, concise way. Um, I can't emphasize enough at this point, when we're making these choices, we're really, really grateful we did our homework because we know we can answer questions and defend the choices we're making with full confidence. Knowing the whole story gives us license to edit and not make the babies too precious, right? So at this point, I have something I kind of want you to consider. And whether you're doing graphic design or if you're a writer or you're a PR agent, whatever it is you do, does considering your audience change the transparency of your story? Um, this is something we consider a lot. How much do you allow your audience or your client to dictate dictate the style in which you present the facts you've discovered or the story you want to tell. I'll give you an example from our experience once again. Our film and our subject, Ray Hill, are unrepentantly gay. And I'm not talking LGBTQ, I'm talking gay. <laughs> really, really gay. Ray spent a lifetime sort of working to eliminate the shame that was intrinsic in the LGBTQ Q community for decades. In fact, it was his bottom line mission. It's the basis of the type of activism that he does. So at times, Travis and I are choosing to tell this story uh, with bold images and sentiments, and I'll leave the specifics of that to your imagination. But ultimately, some of what we're using might disturb our viewers, right? Our protagonist has always been outspoken to the point of offending his audience, but how far do we want to push our audience? So once again, we're the filter. We have to make decisions about how far we want to go while still presenting a truthful, clear view of what it looked like to be gay in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So the way the film looks, the way it sounds, the style of the edit, and the graphics, the music choices, and more are all ways that we merge our own personalities and creativity into the facts of the story. We have the facts, and they're presented the way we want to present them. Will some people hate it? I certainly fucking hope so. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people won't like the way it's assembled, and to those people I say, feel free to make your own film. And uh, as I'm fond of saying around the office, if you don't like nudity, don't watch this film. Um, but seriously, the stories that we're presenting belong to all of us. They belong to this community, they belong to the world, and we as creatives are responsible for maintaining their integrity. But on the other side of that issue, the movie is ours, right? So don't get it twisted. These two things can and should coexist. The facts of the story, coupled with the way we choose to filter them and present them. So let's kind of recap what we've gone through here. Um, the first thing I would suggest in any creative endeavor is ask a lot of questions. What's the story here and which part of the story interests you the most? Because you're the one who's going to be in the trenches, obviously, and you need to love it as much as you can. Number two, do your homework so you know what the truth actually is. And by doing this, you'll be able to make stronger choices and generally won't look like an idiot, which I think we all try to avoid most of the time. 
Um, number three, don't be afraid to edit. I know that every story is precious, but if you've done your pre-production, you understand how, what the important elements are to successfully tell this story. And if it bores you or slows you dan down, chances are it's gonna bore your audience, so get rid of it. And finally, and potentially most importantly, don't be afraid to use your creative gifts to filter the story through your own lens. The creative is yours, and it's what brings the story to life and makes it special. So let's explore this, um, the creative is yours part, because it's very important to me, and it's sort of the way I'd like to wrap up this discussion today. I, uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of owning the fact that your perspective and the lens through which you filter your creative work is the gift. Remember what I said at the beginning of this talk, that transparency involves some sort of filter, and in creative work, you are the filter? Um, yeah, well, the importance of your own voice in the story is sometimes easily forgotten when you have deadlines and stress and various factors, but that's where I come in. See, at the beginning of our journey together this morning, I uh, joked about what it means to be a producer primarily because most people don't know what the hell that job is. And two, because producers sort of define their own course. It's kind of different things to different people. And I'm not going to enumerate the various aspects of my job today, but what I will say is that in my case, I'm not the one who's going to be setting the lights. I'm not the one using the camera. I'm not actually physically pushing the buttons during the edit or making the motion graphics. On that level, I'm at a complete loss. I'll be honest about that. What I do, however, is I understand the value of every single player on a, our enormous, talented team. And as a person who does that every single day, and as a person whose own creative vision is dependent on the talents of my friends and associates, I say to you, your lens is valuable. Film is a collaborative medium, and we assemble our teams based on a lot of factors, not the least of which is how each player interprets the information they receive and the way they filter that and broadcast it back into the world. I mean, I hire people on this basis, and people hire you because they like what they see you doing and making. So, to sum it all up this morning, be honest and trust your vision. And to quote our old friend Stephen Sondheim, anything you do, let it come from you, then it will be new. Go forth and create, my friends. And thank you. Thank you very much.